Hi, my name is Hans Hess. Thank you so much for watching the television program today. I'm going to be preaching a message today called, What Happens When I Die? I don't know of anyone on planet Earth that doesn't have that question in their mind or at least have thought about it at some point in their life. What happens when I die? So let's look into the scripture today, and we're given clear answers in the Bible as to what happens when you die. Okay? The Bible says in John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Jesus gives us a clear picture right here of what's going to happen to his disciples at the end, when they reach their end. There's some clues locked in that passage that I want us to look at. So why do we die in the first place? Why do, why do we die in the first place? Secondly, what happens when we die and thirdly, I want to ask the question, do good people go to heaven? Why do we die in the first place? What happens when we die? And do good people go to heaven? These are three questions I want to attack just in the next few minutes. Okay, It's very important to understand what the Bible says about heaven. And some people have been criticized in the past for being too heavenly minded. You know, there's a statement in America saying, some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Well, I, I understand the problem there, but really, C.S. Lewis said, if you read history, you will find that the Christian who did the most for the present world was the one who thought the most of the next. The people who were most effective for the kingdom of God in this life were those who had their eyes fixed on eternity and they understood eternity, and then they live their life with eternity in mind. Because if you don't understand what happens when you die, you might just walk through this life aimlessly and may find no purpose or deep meaning in your life if you don't understand what happens when you reach the end. But if you do understand what happens when you die, then you can adjust your life. You can calibrate your life to the next life. And then you can make all of your days matter. You can make all of your time here on earth matter because you're focused on the end. Who doesn't begin a project unless they have a clear goal at the end? Think about an architect building a home or building a building. They begin with the end in mind. They begin with a plan, with the drawing, with the particulars. Then they calculate how much it's gonna cost how many workers will need to be involved, how long this will take, and then they work that plan until the goal is reached where they see the building constructed or the house constructed just as the plan was. This is how we should live our lives, I think. We should know what the end holds for us. We should calibrate our lives to the end, and then we should live our days out with meaning and purpose driving us to the winning goal at the end of heaven. Amen? So why do we die in the first place? You know, if you read the Bible, in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, man and woman were created, were placed in a garden with all things at their fingertips, everything they needed, and really man and woman were created to live eternally. There was to be no death. But they sinned against God, broke his commandment, broke the rule he had set. And as part of that, the punishment was that they would face death. That eventually they would die spiritually. And the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, did die, did die physically. And something happened to them spiritually. They were disconnected from God. They no longer had the fellowship with God that they had before they sinned. And it was a tragic consequence for humanity. And now, I know it doesn't seem fair, 
But now, every man and woman born after Adam and Eve has been born into the same problem, into the same conflict. And that is, our relationship with God has been severed, and we face death. So it's, it's like we are born to die. We are born, and as soon as we're born, the clock starts ticking, timing us down to the point of our death. It's a really weird situation we're in. But nonetheless, God has given us hope within all of this. But you must know, everyone dies. The, the writer of, of the Ecclesiastes said in one part, in so many words, you should go to the place of death. You should go to the place of mourning. For us, it would be a funeral home. You should attend a funeral every now and then to wake you up to the reality that you will end in this position or in this place at the end of life. Everyone does. The only exception will be when Jesus returns and resurrects the dead and catches up the living. Other than that, every human person will go by the way of death. And we all die because it is the result of living in a sin-cursed world. It's the final, ultimate result of living in a sin-cursed world. And then I ask the question, well, if I'm a Christian, if I've accepted Christ into my heart, and His life has come into me, and He's, he's born, birthed me anew, basically, and I've become a new creature, then why do I still have to die? But we understand that even Christians must face, face death because it is the final result of living in a sin-cursed world. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He said, death is swallowed up in victory. It'll be said one day. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then the saying, oh death, where is your sting? And oh grave, where is your victory? So we know that everyone dies, including Christians, and that it is the final outcome of living in a fallen world. So I want to ask the second question then. What happens then? when we die and when we cross that line of death. And I know there's a lot of beliefs about this. A lot of different religions in the world have their own idea. Each one has its own idea of what happens after death. But I want to give you the Christian version, the biblical version today. As I read it in the Bible, there's only one of two options when you die. And that is, number one, you'll go to heaven where God abides, where the saints abide, or number two, you'll go to hell. And it's a terrible doctrine. It's a frightening doctrine in a way. But hell is a reality. And it is not just a place where you go and you burn up after a while. It's not just a figurative place. I believe it is a literal place just as heaven is a literal place. In fact, the, the, the Bible passage I opened up with, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And the term in Greek is tapos. It's a literal place. It's not just figurative. It's not just spiritual. There is a real hell and there is a real heaven. Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 16 about a rich man who had everything at his fingertips. He was wealthy. And there was a poor beggar man named Lazarus who begged at the rich man's gates every day just for crumbs of food. And the rich man was so stingy and hard-hearted that he would give the poor beggar nothing. And Jesus said both of these men died. The, the poor beggar man was carried into Abraham's bosom, which really is a metaphor of heaven. And then he said the rich man, though, opened his eyes in hell. And in hell, he experienced great torment, so much so that he begged for someone to come and just dip their finger in water and touch his tongue that was parched and on fire. And then he begged that someone would go to his brothers who were still living and witness to them and tell them that there was an actual place like hell. But the reality is that can't happen. Because as Jesus said, there's a great gulf fix. There's a great separation between the living and the dead. And the dead can't come to us and we can't go to them. There's a gulf fixed and separated. So if you're being visited 
by dead relatives in spirit form. It's probably not a dead relative, but a demonic spirit. There's a gulf fixed between the living and dead. And so, and then the word came to the rich man and said, they've rejected all the prophets for years. And they've rejected all preaching for years. Why would they even believe someone who had risen from the dead? It's not going to happen. There is a real place called hell. There is a real place called heaven. I had a friend years ago named William Ward. And he had had visions of hell and visions of heaven. And these are not biblical. They're just his own experience. So take it as that. But he told a story that shook me to the core about lifting up his eyes in hell. And God showed him the reality of hell. And it was a place of complete torment and a place of torture. And then he was allowed to come back after having that vision. And he preached the gospel the rest of his life. Preached in 84 nations, I think it was, of the world. Believing in Jesus and calling people out of darkness. So hell is a reality. It is a place that I'm trying to get you to avoid. It's not the end goal you want in life. But just as hell is real, heaven is just as real. It is a real place. We're given certain glimpses of heaven in Scripture. The Bible says that heaven is an intermediate place and hell is an intermediate place. They're not permanent locations. Why? Because in the end, the Bible says all of hell will give up its dead and then those people will be judged and then cast into the lake of fire, according to the book of Revelation. And all those in heaven will make their abode in the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth that God's going to create, according to the Bible. So heaven and earth currently are intermediate states, but we are headed for a place. John said, I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So for the righteous, for those who've been washed in the blood of Jesus, we will go to heaven and live with Christ forever and then make our way to the new earth or the new Jerusalem or whatever. It doesn't matter to me as long as I get to be with the saints and be with my Lord. It's going to be an amazing place. And what is heaven like? Some ask, do we have bodies in heaven? Well, I'm not really for sure, but I do know that after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he had some sort of body, though it seemed spiritual, because at one point or at several points, he walked through walls in his resurrected body. But then also, he sat on the lake shore and ate broiled fish or grilled fish with his disciples. So you and I, I think as well, will have some sort of body. But then there's a resurrection coming where we will be resurrected, whatever's left of us in the grave, and we will be reunited with our soul and spiritual being that we're going to be, and we'll be created anew, the Bible says, with a new body, a resurrected body. I know it's, it's kind of strange, but that's the way Scripture lays it out. When we get to heaven, will we remember those who are on earth? Will we have knowledge of people on earth? Again, we're not clearly told that in Scripture, but as we see the saints in the book of Revelation, it's interesting that they have an understanding of what's going on on earth, and they're praying for people on earth and interceding. So I believe if you, we have loved ones in heaven right now that we know, friends and family who have gone on before us, I don't know that they know every detail of our lives, but I do believe they are praying for us right now just like the saints were in the book of Revelation. So if you have a grandmother who's passed or a mom who's passed or a dad and they've gone on to heaven, they were righteous, godly people, I think you can be assured that they're praying for you, but this time praying without the veil of flesh and praying without the eyes that, uh, of, of, uh, that we had when they had when they were here. They're praying in a perfected state. And I think that's something to be encouraged about. So what happens when you die? You either go to hell or you go to heaven. And that brings me to the last point that's most important. And I want to ask this question because it, 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 it stumps a lot of people. And that is, do good people then go to heaven? And my answer is another question. What is a good person? 
The Bible says, no one is good except God. Jesus said those words. No one is good except God. I'll ask you another question. Good compared to what? Is it good, a good person compared to a, a torturer? Compared to a terrible person in history like Adolf Hitler? Well, we, we could say we're good in comparison with them, but I think the Bible standard is Jesus himself, God himself, and Scripture. So we need to ask ourselves, are we good in comparison to God? Are we good in comparison to Jesus? And I think the answer would have to be, we've not quite met that standard. So actually, the question is wrong. Do good people go to heaven? Not necessarily. There are a lot of relatively good people who are going to die and go to hell. The answer is this. People born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, are going to heaven. People who have had an experience with God, where Jesus has come into their heart, transformed their lives, and made them new, those are the people who are guaranteed in Scripture are going to heaven. Jesus was visited one night by a Jewish teacher named Nicodemus. And he came to him and he said, what must I do to be born again? Or what must I do to, etern uh, to, to uh, be given eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand what he was saying. And Jesus explained it. This is a spiritual birth. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. There's something spiritual that must happen to you. You must have an experience with God. Jesus said, unless one is born of water and spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. He said, you must be born again. So if we gain access to heaven through our goodness, then the cross and the born again experience is not, not needed. It's, it's meaningless. If we can gain access to heaven by doing good deeds for others, and by being sincere, then the cross and the born-again experience is meaningless. There are a lot of sincere people who are sincerely wrong. If we can gain access to heaven through any other thing except the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ, then all of Jesus' work was meaningless. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and through the sacrifice that He gave on the cross. He said, I am the door to the sheepfold. No man comes in any other way. There are, all, there are all kinds of people trying to come in, but they're thieves and robbers. He said there's one way to the Father, and it's Jesus alone. I know this is kind of difficult to hear sometimes, especially if you're coming from a different faith background or a different religious tradition. And I want to honor your sincerity and the love you have in your heart to be seeking truth. But I want to expose the truth to you today, and that is there's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ and through the work that He did. That's it. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't really know this. I knew just a few scriptures, and I, I, I learned one prayer in my life. And I would say that prayer every day of my life, even when I wasn't serving God. That's all I knew. But when I turned 16 years old, I had a very bad illness, and I was placed in a hospital for a series of days. And while I was in that hospital, a voice spoke to me. The voice wasn't audible. The voice was just inside my heart. And the voice basically told me, what you're living for is not worth living for. And after that experience, I started praying. No one led me in prayer. I had no preacher like this to preach to me. No one to witness to me. I just started praying on my own, asking God to be in my heart and to save me because I didn't want to die in the end and go to hell. And it was absolutely amazing and life transforming what happened to me. Jesus came into my life. He resurrected my spirit, basically. Brought it back to life. And my eyes were awakened to spiritual things and, and to the life of God that had come in me. It was a, it was a born again experience. It was a born again experience. If you've never had that, I want to pray with you right now. I want to pray with you today before I, before I go off here, okay? Maybe you've never had that experience with God. Maybe you've been, in, been raised in a Christian church or a Christian family, 
And you've maybe attended church or, or gone through the motions, but you never had that experience with God. Well, I want to push you and say you need to experience God. You need to open up your heart and let Him come in. It's the only thing that will forgive sins. It's the only thing that will take you to heaven. And it's the only thing that will prepare you for the end of life and what happens to you when you die. Accept Jesus into your life. Be transformed. In the Bible, there's a story given to us in the book of Acts, chapter 9, where, the, where, where Paul, he was formerly named Saul, and he was a, a Jewish persecutor of the church. He was chasing down Christians to capture them, imprison them, and even have them executed. But yet, while he was on the way to Damascus to, to capture more Christians, the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And when he met the Lord Jesus, he fell down on his feet, as if he was dead. And Jesus gave him a commission. And he came back up, and scales were over his eyes, the Bible says, and he couldn't see, he was blinded. A certain Christian man came to him named Ananias, and he prayed for him. And when he prayed for him, the Bible says, he, he received his sight, and the scales were lifted off of his eyes, and he was baptized and became one of the greatest preachers and greatest defenders of Christianity and greatest apostles known in the history of Christianity for 2,000 years. What happened to him? I think him gaining his eyesight was a metaphor of what was really happening in his heart. I believe he really did gain his eyesight, but it was also a symbol of what was happening in his heart. His heart was awakened. The scales had fallen off his spiritual understanding, and now he realized Jesus is the only way, and he really is the Savior. He really is the Messiah of Israel. What happens when you die? You go either to heaven or to hell. How do you get to heaven? Accept Jesus into your heart and have a born again experience. All right, I want to pray for you right now. Wherever you are, in a car, at home, outside, holding a cell phone, watching me right now, whatever you're doing, I just want you to stop right now. And I want you to take inventory of your life. I want you to ask yourself, am I ready? Am I prepared for the end of life? And ask yourself, am I living with the end in mind? Am I living with the end in mind? Or am I just kind of meaninglessly walking through life with no purpose? Are you ready for the end? Are you living with the end in mind? If you're not, I want to pray for you right now. Wherever you are, whatever country you're in right now, I want to pray for you, okay? So just, just pause for a moment. If you want to accept Jesus into your heart, pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all sin. I accept you into my heart as Savior. Come into my life. Make me born again. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, just go ahead and thank God. Just go ahead and thank God. Whether that means lifting your voice, raising your hand, smiling, on your, smiling with a smile on your face, whatever it takes, just go ahead and give God some thanks. Secondly, I want to pray for you who are not, who've not been living with the end in mind. Maybe you've just been running after your own purposes. Maybe you're born again, but you've just, you just been kind of floating through life. Set your mind today to say, I'm going to live with the end in mind. I'm going to make every moment count. I'm going to make every day count for my Lord. Come on, pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for my friends out here listening to me today. And I pray, God, they get purpose in their life purpose in their heart from this moment on to live with, with, with a vision and a goal of the end in mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to me today. What happens when I die? All people face death, even Christians. There's only one of two places you go when you die, heaven or hell. Do good people go to heaven? Not necessarily. It's the born again that go to heaven. Know that. It's the born again that go to heaven. Listen, you can follow me. There's social media links below. You can watch us every week, or you can visit us if you're ever in the northeastern area of North Carolina. We have churches in Elizabeth City and Edenton, North Carolina. I love you guys. Be praying for us as we continue to spread the gospel all across the globe. It's amazing what God has done in the past year. I'm being able to preach 
uh, in many different countries of the world, preaching to unreached countries and unreached villages. I believe we're pushing into and entering into a great time of revival for the world, okay? I love you guys, and God bless. Hey guys, what happens when I die? That's a powerful question. And who goes to heaven? Do the good go to heaven? Well, actually, the born again go to heaven. I pray you learned something today and that, that this message was a blessing to you and encouraged you. But you know, in that same passage that I began with in John 14, Jesus said, He said, And whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I mean, listen to that. Whatever you ask in my name, in my name, the authority of Jesus' name, He said, I will do that the Father may be glorified. That is like a blank check of prayer. It's like just this open-ended promise of prayer that we ask in the name of Jesus and then God performs what we ask in His name. And we have faith. The psalmist said, if I had not believed that I would receive your blessing in the land of living, I would have given up hope. So we believe that God will bless us in the here and now. Well, my daughter Alex Garcia is with me today, and she's going to tell you how you can contact us for prayer and how you can send in your prayer requests, and we'll pray over them and ask God to do what He said right here in John 14, 15. Hey, we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to partner with you in believing for whatever you're praying for right now. So if you do have a prayer request, you can visit the website IamHansHess.com and go to the Contact tab and email us there and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. We are believing with you, we're praying with you, and Jesus is good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And also our YouTube channel is up. Yes. Also soon we're going to be putting more content on our YouTube channel, Hans Hess. So just keep a lookout and subscribe because content's coming soon. Yes. So, we're, you know, I pastor a church every week and so we pray for people on a weekly basis, but I don't know where you're watching us from around the world, but uh, we want to be able to connect with you in prayer and all of our information is provided. Love to see you join us again. Join us online on our online campus or in one of our physical campuses if you're ever here in North Carolina. Okay. We love you dearly and may God's richest blessings be towards you.